Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for taking time out to listen to a few uh, stories from around the country. And I do hope you find this uh, interesting. Uh, um, I realize that, that uh, there will be some questions in your mind, since this is a rather different field. And I would be happy to take questions during the break after the talk. Right? Thank you. So I was brought up on a forest estate in the West Himalay. And during the 60s and 1970s, we depended on springs for our water supply. So the, the ebb and flow of the springs through the year was uh, directly linked to how much water we could use at home. So I developed an interest, and it was, it was perfectly natural that we would follow the trend. And during the 80s, there were a lot of forest fires in the hills, a lot of lopping, a lot of degradation, administrative controls broke down, so forests suffered. And as the forest suffered, we realized that the, the outflow from the springs was decreasing during summer. So the obvious thing to do was to replace the forests and thereby stabilize the flow of springs. From there, I realized that what works at a, at a micro level would work at a macro level. If our springs were drying up, it was followed by a corresponding increase in floods in the Indian floodplains. So, if we could rejuvenate our springs, we would actually stabilize our rivers. So with a, with a view to working that out, I thought of using butterflies to stabilize our rivers. And I'll tell you how. Mm, this is a river in Arunachal Pradesh, where, to a large extent, the forest cover is still intact. And uh, there are rivers which, in any case, flood. They have historically had floods during the monsoon. On the other hand, they are, uh, the dry season flow of many Indian rivers has dropped considerably. So we are trying to stabilize that. We are not talking about a panacea which would stop floods in Indian rivers altogether. Now, we have a common conception that rivers that originate in the Himalay, they are snow-fed. There was some years ago, there was a, there was a scare put out that if the Himalayan glaciers dried up, the uh, Gangetic river system would become seasonal. Now, this is not necessarily true because the snow mountains are only a part of the range. As you see over here, the, the area under perpetual snow is not the entire range, it's just the higher elevations. Right? This is a Himalayan river in the main range. At the bottom, you see a cross-section of the Himalayan range, which has been taken from a common or garden atlas. To the left, we have the sub-Himalayan tract. That receives relatively low rainfall, about less than 40 inches. In the second tract, I'm afraid I don't have a pointer, so you'll just have to follow it. In the second tract, the first range of the Himalayan mountains, the outermost range, that receives up to 10 feet of rain. In the third tract, which is the largest area where it doesn't snow, that receives 40 to 80 inches of rain. And the area of perpetual snow is, in fact, in the main range over here. And the, the actual snow area is this much. And this region receives less than 40 inches of rain a year. So it's quite obvious to see that the Himalayan, the Himalay, the rivers that originate in the Himalay are largely rain-fed rather than snow-fed. True, they originate in the glaciers, but the main water budget comes from rainfall, from springs. Right? Now, this is a river in the main range. At the back, there are snow mountains, which unfortunately it was a bit hazy. And this little stream, this perennial stream coming down, originates in glaciers up there, but it is supplied with, to a large extent by water from this area, from the forests here, from springs. The main thing that one has to think of in rain-fed rivers, and I would add that all peninsular Indian rivers are rain-fed. And for, in an Indian context, it is very interesting because we control the entire length of our rivers. If, it's, if we can stabilize them, we would look at water security in the future. We can, we, it's in our own hands. Now, 
to stabilize that in any Indian river. Uh, now I'm, I'm moving out of the, the Himalay and the snowfed snow thing, and we're talking about any Indian rivers. The important thing is that when the monsoon rains come, they come, you know, torrential rain. And how to stop that torrential rain and let it percolate into the soil. The way to do it is to have an undisturbed forest canopy. You see, when, it, when, it hits, when the rain hits the canopy here, the canopy breaks the force of the raindrops and only a trickle reaches the, the soil, which soaks into the soil. Now, a degraded canopy is over there. The white part is snow. Ideally, you should not have been able to see that white. If that canopy was not degraded, you would not see anything white over there, and that would give rise to a perennial healthy river, a healthy stream. In, unfortunately, we do not have any measure for the health of a forest. On government records, that is as good a forest as this. We have they have measures for canopy cover, for green cover, and all that, but, but it really doesn't work because it depends on the season at which the green cover is measured. If you measure a deciduous forest during the, the summer, it'll be very, very dense and green, and in the winter, there's nothing. So actually, we are, look, we are trying to find a way to measure the health of a forest. Now, in a city, a city is a, a large group of houses. If somebody, say, from, from outer space comes here, he will not be able to distinguish between the various cities because they all consist of a large number of houses. The things that distinguish one city from the other are what the inhabitants of that city do. Delhi is an administrative center. Bombay is a trade center. Other places have their different industries. So it is not the houses that make a city. It is what the people do. In the same way, it's not the trees that make a forest. It is the inhabitants it supports. So we try to look at the inhabitants of forests. Mammals are rather large, and they tend to move too much, so you can't really attach much significance to their presence or absence, unless on a very large scale, like tiger habitat or elephant habitat, but not to a watershed or not to the source of a stream. It's too small. The same goes for birds. Birds can travel 50 kilometers a day or more. So we looked at insects. Many insects are very local, and their presence or absence signifies things. So they are called bio-indicators, that means living indicators. So we're looking at the community of insects that inhabits forests and trying to judge the health of the forest on the basis of these indicators, right? Now, this is a, that is, on, on government records, that is a forest and that is a forest. This forest consists of a community of over a thousand plant species and over a thousand butterfly and moth species. And that, is, I've, I've, I've been very generous in saying to less than 200 plant species. It's the, the figure is closer to 50 plant species. And about 50 Lepidoptera, the figure is closer to, to 20. But still, let's be generous. Now, in the case of this, the raindrops came down, the force was broken, they reached the soil, they percolated into the soil, and some months or years later, they reached the stream, and it flows down. It's perennial. And in that case, the rain came, nothing stopped it, it hit the soil, it, it washed away what it could, and you have gully erosion, streams that are active immediately during or after the rain and dry the rest of the year. Right? Now that's undesirable, that is a cause of floods, and this is desirable, this would stabilize our water security. So in looking at butterflies, there is a large community of butterflies and different butterflies do different things. This is a typical landscape in the largest zone of the Himalaya, which I, I would say, this is where the Ganga originates, right? And as you see, in the foreground, there are some oak trees. And in the background, this area is under pine. It's all under pine. It shouldn't be under pine. The day we can look at this landscape, and you saw the earlier photograph of the dense canopy, if we could get that canopy cover over here, we would look at water security in the plains in summer. Now, how to set about doing that? How to measure it? These are butterflies which are found all over the country. Their presence or absence really doesn't mean a thing because they are migrants, they travel very far, and um, uh, they're very pretty, but, but they really mean not much, except in a very broad context, when pollution levels go beyond anything. At the same time, we have very, very local butterfly species 
these ones are found within forests, and even within forests, they would be restricted to, a, to an area which is less than half the size of this courtyard. So I could, I could point you to a place where these butterflies occur and say, well, they occur in that forest, and you could search, search a lifetime there and not find them until you hit on the right spot at the right time. So they're extremely local. We are trying to understand the factors that govern the distribution. Why don't they expand? Why, what factors are controlling their, their distribution? And from that, we would understand what the forest, what, what is special about that particular forest. Right? In the case of these butterflies, the red body signifies that they're poisonous. They contain aristolochic acid. In the Western Himalaya, we have four species of these red-bodied swallowtails. Three of them feed on a climber called Aristolochia. Now, we have one species of Aristolochia in the Western Himalaya, in the Uttarakhand Himalaya. And all these three butterflies share that plant. So in a way, there is competition between them. They are very common in May and June. If you go to the hills you'll, and you see horse chestnut trees flowering, you'll probably see a bunch of these chaps around them too. But what do they signify? Their presence signifies that their food plant is in the area, and it signifies that that plant might be small or large. Now, I'll tell you the difference, what that signifies. Here we have a picture of the golden birdwing. The golden birdwing also feeds on that same climber that the red-bodied swallowtails feed on, with the difference that it is a much larger butterfly. It's the second largest Indian butterfly. It grows about that big. And those chaps are about that big. Now, the difference between the golden birdwing and the red-bodied swallowtails is that the golden birdwing's caterpillar needs to feed on the seed pods of Aristolochia climbers. Right? That seems a very, very mundane difference. But um, the truth of the matter is that Aristolochia climbers are found all over the forest. But in places where there is no water, they grow about two foot high with about 20 leaves which is enough to support the red-bodied swallowtails. But they do not flower. And if they do not flower, naturally, they do not bear seeds or seed pods for these chaps to feed on. So if you have a forest where there are only the red-bodied swallowtails, where only these chaps are around, it means there are Aristolochia climbers in the area, but probably no perennial water. If you have a forest where you have the red-bodied and the bird wings, it means that the seed pods are being produced by the plant, and this plant only produces seed pods when it grows near perennial water. So you actually have an indicator of perennial water. Right? And if the population of these starts dropping, then something is wrong with the water system. The plants are drying up. So you know it sets off the alarm bells. Another example of setting off alarm bells are these two butterfly species, the great black vein and the Himalayan sergeant. They both feed on barberry, which is distinguished by the, by the thorns on its leaves. Now, this is a, a perfectly normal bush, nothing special about it. The great black fin has one generation a year, so you only see it once a year for two weeks. So it's not a big indicator. But the Himalayan sergeant is continually active from March till December. The interesting thing about the Himalayan sergeant is that it is territorial. So males will patrol a certain small patch of forest, generation after generation, year after year. So at any time, if you know where those beets are, they're called beets. If you know where those beets are, you can actually go there and look for these guys. Right? Now, during the 1970s on our estate, we noticed that, well, in the garden, actually, there was a garden hedge, and there used to be these chaps there all the time. And suddenly, they weren't there anymore. So we started looking around for them. And we discovered that they were nowhere in their regular haunts. So what, what went wrong? And then we found that an, a drug company in Delhi had given an order for the roots of this plant. And naturally, the villagers had gone and dug all those plants out. And the butterfly population collapsed. And that is the first we heard about it, because this was all being done on the sly. So when we went and checked out all the barberry bushes, there were none. So we stopped the collection of this uh, root. The population of Barbary came up again, and the, these chaps came back again. So this is bioindicators in action. Right? Uh, there's a person called Torben Larsen, a Danish entomologist. And he works mainly on Middle Eastern Lepidoptera. 
Now, this butterfly called the Indian fritillary has a very large range from Ethiopia across the Arabian Peninsula to the Himalay and down to Papua New Guinea. Very, very large range. And he, since he was working on Middle Eastern Lepidoptera, he was uh, writing about the butterflies of Yemen. So he looked high and low for this because he knew it occurred to the left and it occurred to the right, so it should occur in the center too. And he couldn't find it. For years, he went all over Yemen, he couldn't find it. Finally, he went to the university, to the botany department, and said, look, where do violets grow? Because these chefs feed on violets. And there he was told, sorry, there are no violets in Yemen. So <laughs> that was a, took a long time for him to discover that. This is one of the best examples of camouflage. It's called the orange oak leaf butterfly. It changes with the season. Different generations modify their leaf-like appearance to imitate dry leaves at different seasons. In the summer, they are pale brown. In the monsoon, in the wet season, they are dark brown. It has not only imitated a dry leaf to perfection, it has even made a transparent hole in the wing to break up its outline. In nature, hunt, uh, predators recognize their prey by silhouette recognition. And they have broken up their outline so that they break up the silhouette. The interesting thing about the oak leaf is that it has a tip to its wing. This is a very rare phenomenon in butterflies. The reason for that tip is that oak leaves are found in humid forests where the leaves have developed what are known as drip tips. That is to help the leaf drain moisture as soon as possible so the leaf doesn't rot. Now, oak leaves, by the fact that they have developed a, a drip tip, have restricted themselves to humid habitats, forests where such leaves grow. Therefore, the presence or absence of oak leaf butterflies signifies the humidity in the area. If we know that once upon a time, oak leaf butterflies occurred in a certain area, it means the drip tip leaves occurred, it means it was a humid area. There are many other butterflies that mimic dry leaves, but as you will notice, they do not have a drip tip. They're generalized. Um, these are endemic. This is an endemic butterfly, which, although the range of its food plant is uh, across the Himalaya to Bhutan, Himalayan oak, but it does not occur west of Nepal. So there's something that there that we don't understand. There are many factors. This is the, the cabbage white, whose distribution is restricted by heat. It cannot colonize the plains of India because this Indian summer dries out its lava and caterpillars. And this is the bath white, which is related to the Indian cabbage white, to the large cabbage white, but because of the inadvertent import of its food plant from America called the Virginia peppergrass in wheat shipments during the 1950s, as this peppergrass spread across the Himalay, the butterfly leapt over the Himalay and has spread along all the way to northeastern India. So there are different factors that control the distribution. These are butterflies that feed on plants which cattle graze. So their presence or absence gives us an idea of the grazing pressure in a forest. These are plants that feed on uh, leaves of trees which are lopped for fodder. So their presence or absence tells us about lopping pressure in an area. And this is a butterfly which feeds on the leaves of palm trees, which are used for thatching. So again, the presence or absence tells us about the pressure on palms. In this way, this feeds on lichen. Lichen, as you know, uh, is supposed to be a very good indicator of air quality. So again, we can get an idea of the lichen in an area from the presence or absence of these moths. So as this, was, this was the first example of bioindicators being used to track climate change. Ideally, it would be very nice to see forests where congregations of butterflies like this are common. Unfortunately, it's getting rarer and rarer. Right? Thank you.